Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your mineral rights and royalties. In this episode, we talk about investing in mineral rights and royalties. But before we get to today's show, I have a quick reminder. As always, please subscribe to the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast, and please leave us an honest rating and review. We read every one of them and sincerely appreciate the feedback, and to be featured on an upcoming episode, leave that review and we'll uh, give you a shout out. So you can reach us at feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com with any questions or comments. And as always, the show notes can be found at mineralrightspodcast.com. And now on with the show. With me today is Justin Williams. Hey, Justin. Good morning, Matt. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on the show. And thank you all for listening uh, to this episode of the Mineral Rights Podcast. And today we're going to talk about investing in oil and gas, mineral rights, and royalties. But before we get to that, I want to give a couple of shout outs to a few of our listeners who have left a rating and review on iTunes. Crude Interest says, excellent. If you own mineral rights, this is a podcast you must listen to. And the next one, Justin, I don't know how to pronounce that, but I'll just say Mike because <laughs> it's a, there's no, there's no vowels in that, in the, uh, in their username, but it says great podcast, loving the podcast, been wanting to hear about that topic as a petroleum engineer from CSM as well. Would like to dive deeper into buying and investing in mineral rights for novices in a future episode. Thanks. I'll call you Mike. Great to hear from a, a fellow uh, Colorado School of Mines alum and uh, industry uh, vet and uh, appreciate the feedback. So, and because of what, you know, that is is kind of what we're going to talk about today. So just because of that and a few other requests that we've gotten, uh, we wanted to address that with just some information on investing in mineral rights, sort of the other side of the coin than, than what we usually talk about. Um, and then before we get to the, the content here today, like uh, you can imagine, because we're going to talk about investing, there's going to come um, with a disclaimer here. So we're going to just talk about today's topic for informational purposes. As we've mentioned before, there can be significant risk associated with investing in oil and gas. And the uh, information discussed today is, again, for informational purposes only, is not a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell any security. The information discussed is not intended to be used as individual investment or tax advice. And since each individual's tax situation is unique, consult your tax advisor regarding current tax laws and their effect on your situation. And, you know, again, this is a, a topic that may not be suitable for all investors. So oil and gas properties should only be considered by those who can withstand the loss of the entire investment. So it can be a, a risky investment, does have some some pros and cons going with it. And we'll, and we'll talk about those here in a minute. And before we get into the, the uh, details, if you need a refresher on the difference between minerals and royalties, um, please listen to episode two of the Mineral Rights Podcast. And then also would likely be helpful to listen to episode four, where we talked about how minerals are valued, you know, because that kind of goes into the, the basis for how much you can invest and what are you going to get for it. And that is important to understand the principles behind that. All right. So as you may know, the drilling boom uh, across the U.S. has caused mineral rights and royalties become a much sought after investment by individuals and private equity companies. Uh, the upside of minerals and royalties is you can get to invest in oil and gas wells without having the burden of drilling or operating costs. So we're not going to talk today about investing in uh, working interest, non-operated working interest, just in the royalty side of things. And then given the, the booming economy over the last couple of years, there's a lot of investors that have money that and they want exposure to this market at an attractive price and minerals can often fit this bill. That said, the interest in mineral rights over the past couple of years has really heated up and, and in really hot basins like the Permian Basin has caused prices to go through the roof. Anecdotally, you know, we've heard of offers upwards of $25,000 per net mineral acre for purchasing, and that's pretty conservative. Um, even there's been others, I believe, higher than that, but I have multiple people and, and kind of seen 
those numbers. And again, that's for minerals in the Delaware Basin with uh, 25% royalty. You can sort of scale it up or down um, if you have uh, a lower royalty rate. You know, again, really hot areas. All of the demand for minerals has like, like the supply and demand curve, you know, driven those prices up the curve. So um, something to think about before you get into investing. Absolutely. And there's really been some huge players who has gotten into the game over the last couple of years. And one of the biggest is InCap. Um, they're a Houston-based investment firm, um, and they've spent over $1 billion in mineral investments. Um, another big boy is Blackstone Minerals. They've invested in over half a billion dollars. Um, and these companies are absolutely massive companies who have kind of put it into their uh, their plan to grow with these minerals, and it's been successful for them. Um, there are countless other private equity firms out there investing as well, and many oil and gas operators have created their own mineral teams to invest in minerals in addition to operating oil and gas wells. Um, and that was something that used to be really popular, and you're seeing again uh, people like Anadarko and other operators are really trying hard to acquire a lot of those uh, mineral assets when they can. Uh, there are several other types of investors out there as well, from speculators and landmen who look to buy minerals and flip them to other investors for a profit to companies like Matt's who generally invest in minerals for the long haul across several basins to diversify and help spread the risk. Um, there's many different types of investment companies and they all kind of utilize different business models. But now is the time that everyone's kind of playing in the game. Um, either they're investing or they're trying to get their foot in so they can grow their portfolio. Um, some of the pros and cons of investing in oil and gas, some of the pros are tax advantages. Um, depletion deduction, selling an asset may fall into long-term capital gains. Uh, one of the nice things about your royalty checks is there is the ability to deplete those every month when you receive a royalty check. Uh, because if you can imagine, they're depleting that reservoir where they're pulling that oil from. Um, and you can show that on your tax return as well in depleting those assets. Um, another pro is they can deliver really good returns if you buy at the right price and if wells are either drilled soon afterwards or if producing minerals and production continues at expected rates. Um, so typically, any time that a well is getting started, it's the time that everybody's looking to get in. Um, if you own mineral rights, I'm sure that some of you have seen those letters coming in the mail, and usually they're a sign of something to come. Um, unleased minerals can provide cash payments in terms of lease bonuses before wells are even drilled. Um, you can earn some income that way. Um, and that's typically if you own the mineral rights to a property, the oil and gas companies will come to you and they will be looking to sign a lease with you to explore um, or to drill a well within the, uh, the next time frame. And with that comes the leasing bonus. Ownership of real estate under the surface of the earth is also another pro of oil and gas investments in a way that you can kind of defer some tax. New formations and technologies being discovered all the time in the oil and gas world um, is something that really is a leg up for investors and something they count on. Today, when they're producing, it's pretty much guaranteed that we know in the future they're going to be able to improve that technology and do a better job of either pulling more under the ground or a better job of finding more oil in that one spot where they're drilling. Um, something Matt and I have talked about recently is that for quite a while now, they've actually been drilling off multiple what they call daughter holes off of one main hole. So one well pad now can produce from several different formations, which is different than they used to. Um, with the pros, of course, comes the cons. Uh, with oil and gas, taxes on the lease bonus payments and royalties are typically treated as ordinary income. Um, and that's really obviously not the best thing in the world for taxes. You're also at the uh, mercy of the oil company when you're signing a lease, which is kind of something that a lot of people don't realize when they're getting into this agreement. Um, there is that chance that the oil company will never drill well. Uh, they may be able to release you from that lease without drilling that well and getting any of the ongoing income going. Um, and that leasing bonus would be the only income that you saw from that property. Oil and gas is also very much so at the mercy of commodity prices. Oil and gas prices may be good when you buy it, but a downturn in prices could have a significant effect on royalty checks. Um, we've definitely seen that happen in the past. You have to be a sophisticated investor and know what you're getting into, um, especially when it comes to oil and gas assets. It's not for everyone. Um, you need to invest in the right areas and with the right geology. Um, and a lot of times it takes a lot of due diligence on the part of the buyer, making sure that you're buying in the right area and also having an understanding of how those are going to operate and what's to come. And you also want to be sure that you're investing in something that's going to be around for a while. Um, if the operator is a fly-by-night operator or a flaky operator, you could certainly get into a situation to where um, you're really not recouping any return on investment from that. It can be very complicated to invest directly on your own finding deals, doing the proper due diligence like we spoke about. And that's everything from um, working with a landman to run title can get very expensive to working with a geologist to know exactly what, what is under that land that you're buying and what is the likelihood that that is going to produce for you. 
You need to have a really good trusted team of advisors. And I think anybody who's gone down the mineral rights road um, knows that this can be something that can be really challenging to find. Um, lawyers, accountants, engineers, um, and other people who can just genuinely guide you along the process. First of all, everyone has to make money for their time. And second of all, finding that one that you work well with um, and that you trust can be challenging. Also, something that a lot of people don't consider when they're wanting to get into this is you really need to have enough funds to be able to lose the entire investment without it causing you to really have a lot of heartache or for you to go broke. Oil and gas can be extremely volatile. And even though the market right now is extremely hot and profitable, that could change within a, um, a matter of a couple months. And any of that money put into it could be something that uh, you should be you should understand that you could lose. Another con to the oil and gas world um, is you have to be careful of the pe people picking up the phone and giving you a call looking for you to invest in oil and gas investments. Um, and every few years, there seems to be a company who gains some traction who does this, but it's not all that it seems. Um, and you have to be very careful of what it is that you're actually investing in. Just because you pick up the phone and they're asking you to invest in an oil and gas well and they're making it sound wonderful does not necessarily mean it's something that you, you want to be a part of. Yeah. So, you know, if you are going to look at um, different options to invest in oil and gas, there are several out there. And, you know, you can invest in publicly traded companies that are um, out there that just play in the minerals game. And that's one way to do it. That's something where you just can go through your brokerage account, buy that stock, and you have, you're investing in oil and gas mineral rights through that company, through owning, a, you know, shares of that company. There are obviously other methods out there. And we'll talk a little bit in more depth about those other methods. First one I'll mention is if you want to invest in a mineral rights fund. So again, the caveat here, you have to be an accredited investor is defined by the SEC. Um, if you don't know what that is, then, then you probably don't fit into that category. So that might not be the right way to invest. But if you are going to invest in a fund, this is where it becomes very important to do a lot of due diligence on the company and the founders and, you know, understanding what their track record is, what basins they're investing in. And before you go into getting into the details with the specific company, you probably should do some high level research on your own to understand what are the basins that you'd like to invest in, you know, where you, where do you want to, what are some of the operators and where do you want to invest where you have a good feel for the geology and the risks and kind of everything going on in that basin. And then when you get into the specific company, once you identify the basin and locate the, the companies that, are, that have mineral rights um, funds that you can buy into, you need to understand the type of security that you're investing in. And so making sure that you're matching the fund that you're looking at with your individual investment goals. So in other words, do you want a fund that invests in both producing and non-producing mineral acreage with maybe a mix of both near term and then longer term, say three to five year time horizon for when wells are drilled? And then also look at what their targeted returns are. You know, so for example, you would like, because this is a little bit more of a risky investment, you're looking for maybe a 25% rate of return and you want to look at funds that are targeting that based on the um, economic models that they've run and, and their assumptions. And then the other thing too, is you want to understand what the exit strategy is. So in other words, when are you going to get your money back, right? So if they may have an exit strategy three years from now, or maybe five years from now, where they want to um, achieve those returns by that time period and kind of annualize returns, and then the other thing you want to look at is sort of what are their uh, what's their price deck in terms of commodity prices? You know how might low commodity prices affect their exit strategy, and have they articulated that? So if you have a downturn in the middle of uh, you know say year three, how is that going to affect the uh, remainder of the time? And are they going to try to liquidate, and you're going to maybe lose your money, or are you willing to maybe have them hold on to that for a little bit longer to try to achieve the desired return. So something to think about there, just kind of, are your principles aligned with the principles of the, of that fund? And then the other thing you got to think about is how much do you have to spend and what is the minimum investment to buy into that fund and what's the unit size? So, and, and kind of how, how big is that fund going to be? What's the maximum offering amount? And a lot of times these funds are set up as limited partnerships. 
and you will become a li limited partner uh, by uh, investing. And there are certain things that come with being a limited partner. And so you'd want to talk to your attorney and accountant to understand the, uh, the legal and the tax implications of becoming a limited partner in that fund, you know, should things go south, for example. And there are other potential structures and, you know, understanding the structure that maybe you think is the best fit for your personal situation. Another important thing is, you know, what are the fees that they're going to charge? So they're, they're not going to set up this fund and just run it for free. Obviously, they, they're probably going to participate as well. And so they have the upside with you. But generally, there are management fees. And what is the percentage, you know, return that they're going to get on the management fee side? Companies should provide the detailed financial forecasts and then state those key assumptions so that you can understand, you know, year by year, what is the projected revenue? What are the management fees that are going to get deducted each year? And then where are you going to be at the end of the term of that fund? And so that's the kind of information that you want to do, you know, really dig into in detail to understand, you know, what their plans are. And then you need to understand if you're comfortable investing with that uh, company based on those disclosures. And then if they won't disclose this type of information, you need to really think strongly about whether or not to invest in that fund, right? Because it's not, they're not being very transparent. So there's um, obviously certain requirements, you know, we'll get into that now in terms of what they have to disclose and what, what they don't. But um, just in, in general, you'd want to make sure there's a lot of transparency there before you get into uh, a, a partnership basically with these, with these folks. Um, Justin, you want to talk about a couple other options? Absolutely. And kind of the flip side of that coin is investing directly in the minerals as an individual. Um, and this can be definitely more labor intensive because you don't have those people doing it for you. Um, and then before you really want to get started investing, you want to set it up in an entity to invest through an LLC, a partnership, whatever that might be. You want to set up a bank account, all the normal startup stuff that you would do. Um, and you definitely want to have that team of accountants, lawyers, and everybody by your side um, to get started in this. The first thing usually is finding the investments. Um, there are quite a few places out there. There are auction sites like EnergyNet um, where individuals can go and, and be a part of bidding on minerals. You can also work with a mineral broker who can bring you opportunities and let you know what is currently on the table and when new things come on the table. Um, and then you can also find deals directly. So contacting mineral owners in the target area. Um, if you know that you want to buy in the Permian Basin or if you want to buy in Colorado, you can go out and you can do some title work and um, find out who owns those minerals and contact them directly to see if they're interested in selling. Either way, you need to be able to do the due diligence on those minerals. Um, and that due diligence is valuation. How much is it worth? What is the geology like? Um, document preparation, chain of title. Are you sure that they own it? Are you sure of the amount that they own? Um, the chain of title looks clear and everything seems fine. Doing a title search again to verify the owner and how much they actually own. Oftentimes, if this is something that has been in family for many years, There'll be some curative measures to do on the title. Um, maybe that's that the uh, record is still in the decedent's name. Uh, maybe it needs to be put into the seller's name. Maybe the will needs to go through probate. Maybe you need to get with a judge and let them determine determine who actually inherited what. Um, there's all kinds of fun things that could come into this. Once that's clear, once you know what you're buying, once you're comfortable with what you're buying, um, there's the handling the closing. So actually, the deed in exchange for the money. Um, typically, there is a process to this, and um, some companies do it differently. And then, of course, there's also the post-closing. So once the money is actually exchanged, typically the buyer will record that deed. Um, and then the process starts of notifying operators of a change in ownership. Um, and then being sure that you can get the paperwork from those operators to receive your return on investment. And oftentimes, there's some caveats to go with that as well, uh, the different things that you have to do. Um, but that is another way to go about mineral investing. Yeah. So, you know, this is just a broad overview today. Again, we wanted to just give you a, a highlight of some of the ways you can invest in oil and gas, mineral rights and royalties. We mentioned, you know, different ways, you know, one, you know, probably from the most straightforward and simple is finding a publicly traded pure play mineral buyer, invest in by buying in uh, shares of that company as it's traded on the stock market, be easy to get in and get out 
you again can get into directly investing in a fund through one of these larger mineral companies. So that is where you become a limited partner potentially and buy units. And then the other one is you can go out and try to find deals and invest directly yourself with individual mineral owners. Again, a lot more involved. You have to do the, the dirty work yourself, so to speak, and, and you have to know what you're doing in terms of the, the steps and what um, you need to be aware of in order to not lose your shorts, so to speak. And then, you know, a, a kind of a hybrid in there is that, you know, going through an auction site like EnergyNet, but again, the principles still apply. You still need to do your due diligence and understand how much is that property worth? Does the owner actually own what they say they own? And so no, no different than if you were really going to contact somebody directly, just a direct mail campaign or a cold call kind of a thing. So a lot, a lot involved with investing in minerals, like we talked about, plenty of pros and then plenty of cons as well to be aware of, but uh, can be a, a lucrative investment and uh, might make sense for certain individuals as part of a diversified portfolio. So again, with any investment, you need to seek the advice of your accountant, you know, financial advisors and attorneys to help make sure that you're making an informed decision that matches your individual goals. And, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, this information is only being shared for informational purposes, just as a request from our listeners who wanted to find out more about how it's done and, and what are the options not meant to be an instruction manual by any means. This is just a very kind of high level overview. Um, but hopefully this was helpful in, in maybe shedding some light on the different options that are out there for folks. So uh, thanks again for listening. And a reminder, again, subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. So please leave us an honest rating and review. And we read every one of them. And if you want to get a shout out on the show like we did earlier, leave your review and we will read it on the show. If you want to be featured on an upcoming episode as well, if you have a company that plays in this space and you're trying to help out mineral owners as well, and or if you have a question that you want to be featured on upcoming Q&A episode, you can contact us at feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com. And as always, the show notes are on the website as well. So you can go there to find links to um, things we spoke about. And uh, thanks again. And until next time. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.